Hi, everybody, and welcome to this month's webinar with Permobile Academy. We are going to get started here in just one moment. Um, we have a very exciting topic for everybody today about mobility in the shoulder and how the Permobile products um, that are selected and that you use play a role in your shoulder health, function, and independence. So we're going to give it just one second, make sure that everybody is good to go. And um, we will get underway here. So um, you have the ability to, um, you are all going to be muted due to the number of participants and attendees that we have today. Uh, there will be a question box that is um, on your, your toolbar so that you can ask any questions as we go along. Um, we will try to address any technical questions as we go, and then any content questions we will um, address as time permits. If we don't have the time live, we will definitely get back to you with an answer to your question upon the completion of the webinar. Um, just some other housekeeping. Typically, the webinar does run a little smoother in Google Chrome if you have access to that. Um, you will be emailed a recording of this webinar if you're attending live with us today, um, approximately two hours after the completion of the webinar. In addition, in that email, if you are listening live, you will have a link to a certificate where you can enter your name and email address, and you can have a certificate of attendance. This is not a CEU course for those in the US, um, but you can get a certificate of attendance should you need that in um, US or Canada. Um, or abroad for any of your certifications. Um, Rachel, our presenter, has loaded in five different handouts. Um, there is a PDF copy of the slides that she'll be using today, as well as some relevant product information should you not have access to that otherwise. And so with all of that information, um, again, just put any of your questions in the question box. And Rachel uh, Fabiniak, our Director of Clinical Education from Asia Pacific, is going to lead us into this exciting new topic. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Jenna. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are logging in from around the world. Um, today's webinar, as Jenna mentioned, is on mobility and the shoulder and how the permobile products um, play a role into our, our shoulder health function and independence. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic um, just a little bit about myself. My background is as a physical therapist from the US. Um, I do now live in Australia. I'm currently in Melbourne right now. Um, work coming to you for this webinar. And my role, as Jenna mentioned, is the Director of Clinical Education for Asia Pacific. Um, now, we only have about uh, an hour, well not only, we only have an hour today to do this webinar. Uh, so I do want to go ahead and kind of see a little bit about our audience, see who we have with us here today. So I'm going to have Jenneth launch our very first poll. We're going to start off with a poll before we even get into the webinar, which is going to let us know who is joining us today. Um, do we have individuals um, and consumers? Do we have some physical therapists, occupational therapists, or other clinicians, ATPs, um, and we'll let Jenneth tell us uh, about who's joining us today. Yeah, so great. We have a wonderful mix so far of attendees. We have about 19% of our attendees are individuals or consumers that use mobility products. Uh, we have about 50% of our clinical, um, physical or occupational or physio or other clinicians, 27% uh, ATP or in the supplier, working in the supplier or provider realm. We have some funding source in attend, some people working for funding sources, about 1%, and then 2% of um, people that are family members of individuals using mobility equipment. So quite a great mix, and we look forward to, um, you know, hear, 
we, we hope you look forward to the topics that Rachel is going to present. I'll go ahead and close the polls because the numbers are staying right about the same. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you, guys. And um, yeah, great mix of, of people today. So when we talk about the shoulder, um, first of all, we could talk about the shoulder for about eight hours, um, or I could, without even scratching the surface. So today, when we just start to get into it, what I'm hoping we do is, is put some excitement back in, um, get you really thinking and asking questions. Uh, when we start to ask questions and we learn more, whether it's through webinars like this, um, through research, through mentors, um, through your Permobile clinical educators, that's when we really start to be able to take what we've learned and then take that into our practice, or if we're a consumer, take that into what we're doing in our everyday lives. I want to start this webinar off with, you know, why the shoulder is so important to me. Um, you know, I'm connected to this computer right now, so I can only get so excited or I'm going to um, tear out my headphones, but the shoulder I feel very passionate about, and, and part of that is through the individuals that I've met um, as my, when I, you know, as a, as a physical therapist. And one that really impacted me was a client by the name of Jody. Um, and I told Jody I was going to be talking about him today, and he, he said he was honored to have me talk about him. And I said it was such a good learning opportunity. When I saw Jody a few years ago in the community, I went in to see him for what was listed as shoulder pain and a review of his, of his equipment. And when I got there, he told me that he had osteomyelitis in his shoulder. What that is is a, a bone infection in his shoulder. And the doctor told him that this came from years of, of overuse of pushing a manual wheelchair um, and from an antibiotic use, from years of antibiotic use. And what I saw with Jody was, first of all, how much pain he was in. He was in a severe amount of pain with any movement of his left shoulder at all. His range of motion, for those of you that are therapists, he could barely move his shoulder up into flexion. He could barely lift his shoulder more than 10 degrees. He had basically no external or internal rotation. He was unable to propel his manual wheelchair. He was unable to transfer independently, complete any of his ADLs independently. And so I asked him a little bit about his history. He told me he had been a wheelchair user for 55 years. 55 years. Now I had also worked in a rehab center where I saw people that were newly injured. And so when I saw them, I, I would always assess their shoulder, ask them about shoulder pain. But if they didn't have shoulder pain or they had a fully intact, strong shoulder, was I really considering the long-term effects of somebody with a mobility impairment? Was I really considering what was gonna happen 55 years down the road? And this was very confronting to see this with Jody. Jody was an engineer, is an engineer by trade, and so he loves numbers. So he said over the, over the years, he started to figure out how many pushes he did a day. And he said on average, he completed about 2,500 pushes a day. Now, research tells us that the average full-time manual wheelchair propeller pushes two to 3,000 times a day. So Jody felt right in there. He said then he calculated over the time, over the years of being in a manual wheelchair with 2,500 pushes a day, how many pushes that was. And it came to be over 50 million pushes. Think about that number, over 50 million pushes. And then he said to me, I'm pretty sure if I did anything 50 million times, I would have injured it after a while. So what happened? Do we think about clients like Jody from this long-term perspective? Are we considering the shoulder? Are we considering the shoulder not just at that moment, but are we considering the shoulder on a longer-term perspective over the lifespan of the individual? Now, as you can see in this photo coming up, the picture on the left is the picture of a hip. The picture on the right is the picture of a shoulder. If we think about what the hip was designed for, the hip was designed for mobility to get us from point A to point B. It's a nice, what we call stable joint. If you can see where that ball, that, that head of that femur is, it sits in what we call a fossa. 
or I like to call it a bowl. It sits in that bowl. It's protected. It, keep, it keeps it nice and stable. Now, if we look over to the right at the shoulder, can you see that it no longer looks like a bowl? That head of that humerus, I like to say it's sitting on a plate. Look at how shallow that fossa is. Now that shoulder means because that because it's not as stable, it means we get a lot of mobility, we get a lot of movement. We can move our shoulder around quite a bit, a lot more range of motion than we get in our hip. But through all that range of motion, we've also created instability. Instability that can lead to dysfunction, to pain, to problems with the shoulder. Just sh the shoulder was not designed to move us from point A to point B, to have that repetitive movement. Now the shoulder, although it has that really shallow fossa sitting on that plate, it has muscles, it has ligaments, it has things that help strengthen it, that give it that stability. A lot of you, whether you're therapists or, or, you, or end users, you've heard of the rotator cuff muscle that helps support that shoulder. Now, the other thing we have to consider when we're talking about the shoulder is I'm not just talking about your arm, the humerus, sitting in that, in that fossa. I'm talking about the whole shoulder complex. And we often forget this part. We only just think about what we call the shoulder joint. But there's this whole complex to the shoulder that includes four different joints. It includes things like the scapula that we have to take into consideration. When you lift your arm up into the air overhead to reach something, you're not just moving your arm. You're not just moving your humerus. You're having movement of that scapula along with it. You're having movement of that clavicle along with it. For those therapists listening, we have to consider that scapula humeral rhythm. How is that arm lifts, how we have that awkward rotation of that scapula. If we don't have that rotation, what are we leading to? Possible dysfunction. And then we have to consider all the muscles involved. Look at the photo on the right showing some of the muscles around the shoulder complex. There are 17 muscles that attach just to the shoulder blade, just to the scapula. 17 muscles that are needed when we're doing different activities with our shoulder. Now, some individuals with mobility impairment that are using their upper extremities, they might have all those muscles intact, nice and strong, but others may not. And even if all of your muscles are innervated, even if they're all working, they might not be strong enough to support the activities that you're doing. This can lead to different types of, of dysfunction. Here are some of the common presentations that we see. One of the biggest ones that we often hear about is the impingement syndrome. Now there's a video here. Hopefully you guys are gonna be able to watch this video as it goes. Um, if not, I'm gonna talk you through it. So as the shoulder, if we think about just lifting the arm to the side, okay, as you're seeing that shoulder move up, what happens is our muscles help keep that head of that humerus in that fossa. They keep that head of the humerus down but we might have a muscle imbalance or muscle abnormality. And then when we lift that arm up, that head of that humerus migrates upwards. And when it migrates upwards, we can see that little sac, that little fluid sac, that bursa can become impinged. It can become pinched. Now that's just one example of what can happen. But we understand the importance of what's happening within. We need all of those muscles. We need that right balance. And then we have to think about those clients. This is another video. If you can't see the video, just look at this very first photo. Look at the position of the scapula. Do you see how the, the bottom part of the scapula is, or the shoulder blade is tipping outward? Now what ha watch what happens when this individual tries to propel this manual wheelchair. Do we have a fully, strength, a fully strengthened muscles around that shoulder complex? No, we don't. 
Now we can talk about how this wheelchair, you know, may not be fitted properly to this individual. But for right now, we're just focusing on that shoulder position. What's happening to that shoulder when he propels that manual wheelchair? What's happening to that scapula? Even if we take this individual out of a manual wheelchair and we put them into a power wheelchair, which we're gonna talk about later, have we solved this problem? Have we fully solved the issue of a potential shoulder pain or shoulder dysfunction in the future by just putting this individual into a power wheelchair. And this is what often happens, isn't it? One, because of time, we've got funding limitations, we've got time limitations. We don't get to see our clients for as, many, as, as long as we need to. But we have to consider what we're doing, not just from an equipment perspective, but do they need exercises? Do they need strengthening? Um, what can we teach them along with that equipment to help lower that risk? So why does it all matter? Right there, I'm showing you images of the shoulder. We've gone into a very, very brief overview of, of the shoulder. Um, if you're a therapist listening, I cannot recommend enough that you take courses on the shoulder. Find an orthopedic-based course. And, and take it on the shoulder, really learn the biomechanics of the shoulder. If you understand it onto that deeper level, when you watch someone move their shoulder, you're gonna be able to have a better understanding of what's happening. And then how can we assist them? How can we help them to limit that possible dysfunction in the future or that possible pain in the future? So why does it matter? This is a, a chart that I pulled from the clinical practice guidelines on the right that talks about, this isn't even all of them, this is just some of the studies documenting the prevalence of, of, of upper extremity impairment, of upper extremity injuries. Look at all of those studies, right? This, this area has been greatly studied. And here's what we see, up to a 73% reported incidence of repetitive strain injuries. But the most common site being the shoulder. So things like the wrist, right, elbow, there's still other areas, but the shoulder is the most commonly reported site. Guys, that number is too high. That number is way too high. Now we are gonna talk about all the products today. A big emphasis is gonna be on manual wheelchairs because we know that this is a huge area where we, where we develop shoulder pain with individuals with manual wheelchair propulsion, but it's not just people in manual wheelchairs. It's not just people utilizing a manual wheelchair. How about transfers? How about individuals in a power wheelchair transferring? How about completing your activities of daily living? How about all the times that you have to reach overhead if you're seated down, if you're seated in, in, in a seated position? We have to consider these causes as well. So what can we do? What can we do as a therapist, as an end user, as a supplier? What can we do to make an impact? Well, prevention is the key. That's what we have to do. We have to look at prevention. Once the pain starts, it's going to be very difficult then. We're gonna to have to limit someone's mobility. We're gonna to have to limit someone's independence. But if we can prevent this for as long as possible, that's what we wanna be able to do. Today, I'm gonna to be talking, there's, look, there's lots of evidence and lots of research out there that's fantastic. For today's purpose, because we only have this hour, I'm gonna be focusing on two different, um, two different guides here. Resna, the Resna position paper, on the application of ultralight manual wheelchairs, and then also the clinical practice guidelines for preservation of upper limb function following a spinal cord injury. Now, although this is specific to spinal cord injury, I want you to be able to take this information and apply it to whichever you know types of, to whichever individuals, whatever types of diagnosis you might be working with. Both of these are free to download online. If you don't already have access to them, go on to the PVA website, go onto the Resna website and download them. If you can't find them, ask for them. These are fantastic resources. 
that we should all be aware of. The clinical practice guidelines have a summary of recommendations. We're not going to go through all these recommendations today, but I want to keep putting this up to remind you that there, there are recommendations, best practice recommendations that we should be following. So now let's think about how we, how we take this information on the shoulder and then we apply it to what we're doing as far as, as permobile products go or in general, what we're doing when we're, when, we're, when we're scripting out any complex rehab technology. So first let's start with seating and positioning. Now I'm not giving this a fair amount of time because again, we only get one hour. But we have to remember what the shoulder is connected to. What is the shoulder connected to? The shoulder, okay, the upper extremity position, our trunk, is directly related to the pelvis. Look at these images. Now, if it's safe, depending on where you guys are right now, if you're sitting at a desk or sitting at home, I want everyone to sit up nice and tall. Sit on the edge of your chair, okay, if it's safe to. Try to have your night, put your, put your feet on the floor or put your feet on, you know, have some foot support underneath you. Get up nice and tall, give me your best posture. Now I want you to take your arm, I want you to point your thumb up towards the ceiling and lift your arm overhead. Lift it all the way up as high as you can. Okay, nice and slow, don't do it super fast. Everyone always wants to go really fast. I want you to feel that inside of your shoulder as you move it, good. Now I want everyone to give me a really good slouch. Okay, get into a posterior pelvic tilt if you know that, if you know what that is. If you don't know what that is, just give me a really good slouch. Now I want you to do that same exact thing. Thumb up and slowly lift that arm up as high as you can. I'm doing it here. You can't see me. I'm doing it along with you. I want you to notice two things. One, What's the difference in how high you can lift that arm in your range of motion? And two, how does it feel? Do you have a little bit more pain or a little bit of tightness or pinching feeling when you're in that slouchy position? Okay, our posture, our position of our pelvis, our position of our spine directly impacts the position of the shoulder. We have to get the seating right. I can give someone a fantastic power wheelchair or manual wheelchair, but if I put them in a position like this photo on the left, they are not going to be able to fully reach up, but they're still gonna have to, right? They're still gonna have to move around in their environment. They're still gonna have to get that glass up in that cabinet that's high up. They're still gonna have to reach up to push a button. They're still gonna have to reach around in their environment. And now every time they're doing it, they're increasing, right? They're, they're potentially causing damage to their shoulder. They're trying to push past their normal range of motion. It's really important that I consider this. I need to consider where the position of that pelvis is because that's gonna dictate, that's gonna determine where my upper extremity position is. Where my, where my scapula is, how that movement is happening. If I'm in that, if I'm in that kyphotic position, if I'm in that bad slouchy position, what happens to the movement of that shoulder complex? Now we talked about reaching overhead, but also what about propulsion of a manual wheelchair? If you can, reach down to your side and try that again in that slouch position. Now giving yourself, you know, I call it air propulsion. We're not even having to push anything versus if you sit up nice and tall. I'm going to talk about this other, uh, this other idea as we move into the manual wheelchair discussion. So I want to come back to that propulsion and I want to come back to the position of the pelvis and, and our posture. But I want to end it with this idea. We have to have proximal stability for distal mobility. If I can get the client into a position where they are stable, okay, they are seated, they are nice and stable, they have balance in their trunk, in their pelvis, then they are gonna be able to reach around in their environment more. I am protecting the shoulder through doing that. 
So we have to look at the we have to look at the positioning components that we're putting in there. Thinking about what type of solid backrest we're using, how high that backrest position is, thinking about the cushion that we're utilizing and how it supports the individual. Now we're going to move into talking about power wheelchairs. Now with power wheelchairs, this is what happens sometimes, right? We think, okay, the client already, here's, here I'm seeing my client that maybe is a newly injured client needing a wheelchair for the first time. I ask them about their, their shoulder pain um, and they tell me they have some, right? So I'm gonna do a great job and I'm gonna think, maybe I'm gonna put them in a power wheelchair to go ahead and to already protect that shoulder. Have I done enough? Have I done enough? By putting somebody with shoulder pain or shoulder dysfunction, you know, somebody that doesn't have full shoulder strength, full shoulder muscle innervation, by putting them in a wheelchair, in a power wheelchair, have I solved the problem? No, I haven't. I haven't solved the problem. Maybe I've helped decrease the problem by taking away propulsion. But what else did we just talk about? They're still in a seated position, which means they're going to have to reach overhead all the time. Summary of recommendations from our clinical practice guideline. Here it is. Clinical practice guideline recommendation number 13. Provide seat elevation or possibly a standing position to individuals with spinal cord injury who use power wheelchairs and have arm function. So if they have the capacity to reach to reach overhead, to reach up to grasp something, am I giving them the right power seat functions to do that? Am I giving them something like power seat elevation? There's lots of research. You can see some of the cited information below that talks about how it improves, well, we can tell just from what it does, right? We know it's gonna improve vertical reach. We know our client is going to be able to reach higher if we give them seat elevation. For those clients that have upper extremity weakness, pain, limited range of motion, what if their posture, I can't get them into a neutral posture. What if they have a thoracic kyphosis that's fixed and they have limited range of motion of that shoulder? or they've had some sort of premorbid impairment of that shoulder. I can address this through power seat functions, can't I? I can give them more vertical reach through power seat functions, through, through seat elevation. Something that's unique to Permobile, active reach. If you have not seen active reach in person, you need to ask your supplier, the main our Permobile manufacturer, sales rep, or your clinical educator to come and demonstrate what active reach is. Active reach not only allows you to reach more vertical, but it also allows you to reach more horizontal. It gives you more access. It brings objects closer to you, to the individual in that, in that power wheelchair. Think about what that does from a functional standpoint from a shoulder preservation perspective. One of my favorite things to show with active reach is when we take the individual and I have them first try to reach, if you've got the, I know refrigerators are all different now, but let's remember the old school refrigerator from years back where the freezer section is on the top, okay? And I have the person try to reach to get something out of their freezer or out of the top shelf of their, of their refrigerator with just their normal, just their chair in its normal position. Can't really reach, can you? Can't reach to the back. Can't reach up high enough. Then go into seat elevation. Go into that active height position. Now that can reach more vertical, can't it? But you still can't reach quite to the back. And that's when I have them then turn and use that active reach position. And then they can reach and a lot of times they touch the back of the refrigerator. Now that might not seem like a big deal to some of you listening right now, 
But to those of you in a power wheelchair or those of you who've worked with an individual in a power wheelchair who wants to be able to get access to food, to a drink that's in their refrigerator and they can't reach it, that power seat function can make a massive difference in someone's quality of life, in someone's ability to be independent. What else does that clinical practice guideline recommend? Power standing. Now I know that, you know, not everyone is appropriate for standing, but a lot of our clients can be appropriate for standing. Think about now, what is our vertical range and our horizontal range of reach? How much can we protect the shoulders? Look at this photo. I specifically put this photo in to show. What if this woman was in her seated position? Could she reach up and give the, the woman at the desk her credit card for this? To, this looks like a hotel to check into her hotel. Maybe if she's got the right range of motion, how many times just in checking into a hotel would she be doing this overhead activity? If somebody can stand up, how much more accessible are they in their environment? How much more are we limiting the amount that we're asking that shoulder to do? If somebody has already has shoulder pain or shoulder dysfunction, there's a lot mm -hmm. of benefits. To, sorry. Oh, Rachel, I'm sorry. Um, could you clarify what you mean by ADLs and MR ADLs for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So activities of daily living, ADLs, those are going to be things like dressing, um, you know, meal prepping, um, things that you have to do every day in your environment. Mobility related ADLs is just when you have to move to do them when it requires you to move around to do them. Think about if you're making yourself a meal in the kitchen, how you have to be able to move around to get all the things that you need to be able to prep your food and prepare your food. Great question, great question, guys. Now, when we talk about power seat functions, a lot of you are sitting there, we're from all different parts of the world right now, and a lot of you are sitting there and thinking, that's really great that she's saying all of this, we don't have funding, okay? Hopefully a lot of you are shaking your head. Yeah, I was just thinking that. I know. I've gotten to experience a lot of different funding systems now, some better than others, some more limiting than others. And I understand the frustration with funding. It's not just one country, it's every country has frustrations with funding. The biggest thing that we can do is continue to educate continue to educate ourselves, whether we're, the, whether we're the consumer, whether we're the therapist, no matter who we are, whether we're the funding body, we have to continue to educate. Education is the key. Okay, if, this, if your funding body doesn't understand the shoulder, doesn't, they don't understand the risks, um, associated when you don't have the right equipment with developing shoulder pain and dysfunction, then it's going to be challenging to prove why you may need that, why you may need that power seat function. Yesterday, I had a therapist say to me, I know the client would benefit from standing, but I just don't know that I'm going to get it approved. So I think instead, I'm just going to get a tilt only chair, posterior tilt only chair, right? She said, that way I know the client will get their chair. They need their chair. We can't wait years for it to be approved. And I understand these frustrations, but again, if we never try, if we never educate, if we don't push for these power seat functions, then they never will get approved. But if we continue to educate our system, to educate our industry, then hopefully over time changes can happen. Hopefully over time, we can start to see some of this funding. So now let's move into manual wheelchairs. Here's our summary of recommendations once again on what we should be doing, on our clinical practice guidelines for upper extremity preservation. First, we're gonna talk about propulsion. Okay, before we even get into the chair itself, 
when we deliver a chair, when we're, when we're deciding to get someone a manual wheelchair, um, are we teaching them propulsion techniques? Here's the recommended guideline, what the clinical practice guidelines recommend, using long, smooth strokes, okay, that limit the high impacts on the pushroom. Letting the hand drift down naturally when you release the wheel, keeping it below the push rim, not an actual contact with that part of the wheelchair. What does that look like? Here's the four most common propulsion patterns in adults, adults propelling manual wheelchairs. This clinical practice guideline is recommending the one on the left, A, the semicircular pattern. Having that large contact angle, which means where they grab the back of the wheel to where they release the wheel, then having that arm relax down and then coming back around. Are we teaching the semicircular pattern? Now, this might have to change depending on the environment in which we're navigating. But when we're going over some level surfaces, when we're indoors, what type of propulsion pattern are we utilizing? What muscles? I'm not meant to do this to scare you. Um, sometimes I do this and, and therapists start writing down all these muscles. It's meant to appreciate the number of muscles involved in propulsion. There's two phases of propulsion. The push phase, that's when your hand is contacting the, the rim. And then the recovery phase, when you drop that hand down and it comes back around. We're still using muscles, even in that recovery phase. We've got to then lift that arm back up to touch that wheel again. Look at all the muscles involved. What are we doing to ensure that these muscles are strong, that they're balanced from one side to another to try to help support propulsion? There was a study that came out in 2009 by Walford and colleagues, and it described some predictors for development in shoulder pain, in sh for development of shoulder pain with propulsion. And these are the three that we're going to talk about, well, we're just going to mention today. We won't go into detail. Uh, one is when the person has more trunk extension. So that means kind of leaning back. One, another one, less strength in the shoulder adductors. If you're a consumer listening, you know, you don't have to worry about what all the shoulder adductors are, but know that the strength in the shoulder is going to be important. And there's specific muscles that we're seeing that are important. And then more positive shoulder joint work during recovery. So when we're bringing that hand back up to that rim, what's happening? Now that's propulsion. Okay, that's propulsion. Now I want to just summarize propulsion by saying that propulsion is also impacted by the position of the pelvis by their seated position. Oftentimes, right, we start to teach propulsion. We're teaching that semicircular pattern, and then we see everybody going to what I like to refer to as grandpa pushes, okay? Or that second propulsion pattern that we saw, where you release the wheel and you quickly pull back and start pushing again. Now, that might be because the individual isn't aware of how to, prope how to propel their chair, with that, with that semicircular propulsion pattern? Or have we also considered the person's proximal stability? Think about that propulsion, okay? Pretend right now that you're pushing a manual wheelchair. You hold onto the, onto the push rim, and then you release the push rim with both hands, and you have to bring your hands back up and around. During that recovery phase, when your hands are not touching the push rim, you are doing what? Your client is in a hands-free balance position. If they do not have proximal stability, they are not going to be able to take their hands off that push rim, drop it down, and pull it back around. So they're going to just quickly pull back on that push rim have those little grandpa pushes as I like to tell them. So I have to make sure that my position of my pelvis that I put my clients in, I have to make sure that I provide them that proximal stability. It's not just for reaching when we're talking about a manual wheelchair. It's even when we talk about propulsion. 
But then there's also this other part of it, right? How about the chair itself? Clinical practice guidelines, recommendation number seven, provide a manual wheelchair with high strength, fully customizable manual wheelchair made of the lightest possible material. What does Resna say? This is one of my favorite statements of all times. I could spend 30 minutes talking about this statement. Resna states, the person cannot conform to the wheelchair, but the wheelchair must conform to the individual. I want you guys to listen to that one more time. The person cannot conform to the wheelchair, but the wheelchair must conform to the individual. What am I saying there? What we're saying is the wheelchair should be fitted to the exact measurements of the individual in the same way that a prosthetic is fitted. Think about a prosthetic. Think about somebody with a lower limb amputation. Whether you know this from being a therapist, whether you know this from uh, personal experience, whether you know this from someone in your family, a friend, whether you've heard about it, you've seen movies about it, we all know about how important a prosthetic is for an individual with a lower limb amputation. When they get that prosthetic fit correct, what happens? That person is more independent, right? They can use, they, they can move around better. What happens when the prosthetic doesn't fit correctly? When that prosthetic doesn't fit correctly, they have pain. They might have skin breakdown. They might have limitations in their independence or their function. Now think about the individual in the manual wheelchair. If that manual wheelchair is not correctly fitted to that individual, what happens? They might develop pain. They might have, they might develop a skin problem, a pressure injury. They might have lack of independence, lack of function. They can't access their environment. They can't get where they need to go. You're going to see an individual coming up here soon by the name of Nick, who's a paratriathlete. And Nick just received his new tie light. And I asked him, you know, give me something. What, how, do, how does this, what do you think about this new chair? And he said, this new chair feels like an extension of me. That's exactly what I wanted him to say, right? That means that I got that prosthetic fit. Getting that prosthetic fit means that we have to have these chairs custom made. When you order your tie light rigid chair, it starts off as one big long piece of metal tubing that's cut, molded, welded together to get that perfect prosthetic fit. There are other options out there like custom configured, which is where they get a chair that's been built and then they put on, you know, whatever tires and whatever push rims, whatever backrest, they configure it to match your requirements. Does it truly capture that prosthetic fit? And when our chairs are not fitted properly, the individual may not even be aware. If you, your whole life, if we talk about Nick, this, this paratriathlete, he's only ever had one other chair since his injury. He had no idea that his chair, well, it fit him pretty well, didn't have that prosthetic fit to it. It didn't fit him perfectly. Look at this video of this little girl propelling. Look at how challenging it is for her to propel this wheelchair. She's having to use her fingertips because the wheel is so far away from her. Her backrest is so high. Now her parents might be watching this, having never had anyone else in a wheelchair before, and they may be happy and excited because she is pushing herself. But we know that this fit isn't perfect for her. We know that she's having to compensate. We know that she's not as independent as she could be. This is Nick. This is Nick who just received his chair. Now the chair on the left <clears throat> was his old chair, which is still great. I want you guys to watch when he pushes this. This is a very quick video because he just had his chair delivered. We're gonna do more testing with Nick to be able to show. But I wanted, before he even got a chance um, to, to think about his propulsion, 
I wanted to quickly video him. So this first video on the left is showing, whoops, sorry guys, get some volume there. This first video on the left is showing him just pushing his chair. Let's watch that again now that the sound is off. Watch his head. Watch how he uses his head during that propulsion. Do you see that movement? To get that extension? Now, let's turn off this volume here on this side. Now let's watch what happens in his brand new fit the wheelchair like a prosthetic, as he says, his extension of himself wheelchair. Watch that head position now. This was in the first 50, well, I'm gonna say 25 pushes. I immediately took him from our one room over here to get him to propel. Let's watch that again. This is somebody with a paraplegic level of injury, incomplete T4 level of injury. That's a high level athlete, an Olympic level athlete, still at a risk for shoulder dysfunction. So what do we do? How does the setup, how do, how do we get this setup to make a difference, right? How can we make a difference in, in what we're doing when we set up the chair? I don't have a lot of time left, so I can only talk about a little bit. I'm just gonna briefly talk about rear seat height. This is only one of the measurements. There's so many measurements that need to be taken and considered. But since we've talked about propulsion, I'm gonna talk about rear seat height. Our rear seat height is how we enhance the access to that wheel. Okay, where that wheel is positioned in relation to our upper extremity. That allows us to contact the wheel and release the wheel. Where should it be? What's the recommendation? When our hand is placed on the top of that push rim, it's recommended that the elbow angle is between 100 and 120 degrees. How do we achieve that? If we relax the arm down to the side, for somebody that pushes with a fully intact um, hand, somebody with full hand strength, we wanna see those fingertips at that hub. Okay, in the center of that wheel. Now that's when we're talking about where the wheel is in a vertical, in a vertical standpoint. We also have to think about the wheel in a horizontal standpoint. So we can move that wheel on our tie light chairs both vertically and horizontally. You might've heard of the center of gravity if you're one of our, one of our wheelchair users logging, logging on here today. Look at Sergey. This is Sergey. Look at the position of his shoulder in relation to his ear, in relation to his wrist, and in relation to his hip. For those of you that studied um, studied physical therapy, right? We learned about plumb lines. Look at that plumb line. We have that neutral shoulder position. Look at how great that wheel access is gonna be. He's gonna have a bigger push each push that he makes. And he's got that nice alignment of his shoulder. Now, what we do still have to consider, which is why we can't always get this perfect, is the accessibility of the environment and the individual and their level, their skill level with manual wheelchair propulsion. We may have to give up a little bit on that rear wheel position, vertically or horizontally, to help make sure that the person can access their environment and that they're safe with their propulsion. That's something that you work with. If you're a consumer, you're working with both your, your therapist and your supplier. If you're a therapist, you can work with your supplier, your manufacturers to help to, to learn um, and, and to see what tests we can do to determine where that best position is. And then I wanna end with this. I wanna end with thinking back to Jody. Now, Jody has been injured for 55 years. So you can imagine what manual wheelchairs looked like 55 years ago. Some of you are probably laughing, thinking about what they looked like, remembering what they were 55 years ago. They're lighter now, they're better made now, they're more efficient now, but even still, 50 million strokes. What are we doing to protect that shoulder? Jody had no shoulder pain. 
he had full strength in his shoulders when he was injured. But over time, what happened? So for some people, when they're talking about manual wheelchair propulsion, they bring up the idea of power assist. And what I've seen a lot is people that say, well, this person has these things, these criteria, which means they qualify for a power assist, right? Inclusion criteria. This means I should think about a power assist option. But if I can leave you with one thought today, what I want to leave you with is instead of thinking about why someone who maybe already has an impairment to their shoulder or high risk of shoulder impairment, thinking about getting them power assist, how about instead if we always consider power assist? Instead of finding inclusion criteria, Let's think about why someone might not be safe, exclusion criteria. And instead, we always think about power assist for every individual that's propelling a manual wheelchair. There's literature to support this. We can't get into all of it today. Paw Paw stands for a push rim activated power assist wheel. What that means is you see the smart drive on the previous slide, that one sits on the back of the chair. There's also power assist wheels where the, the wheel itself um, is what has the motor in it that, that allows the person to be able to push less or push, it gives them that extra push, pushes them further. Now, there is one big disadvantage of those push rim activated power assist wheels, and that's the weight of the wheel. Having that battery, having that in each hub of that wheel can drastically increase the weight of that wheel which means that if they're not using it, if they don't have it turned on and they're just pushing that chair, normally they're carrying a lot more weight. There is a fantastic course that your clinical educators gave for a lot of therapists out there, the material science of power wheelchair, of manual wheelchairs, sorry, of manual wheelchairs, where they talked a lot about the added weight of wheelchairs. If you took that course, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, um, you know, reach out and ask these questions. And this is the final video. This video was taken by Permobile Japan. And when I saw this video, I couldn't stop watching it. It was a marketing video for Smart Drive. Uh, but when I watched it, I clipped it just to show this one part and I couldn't stop watching it. I couldn't stop watching it. And I've probably watched it over a hundred times now. And every time I watch it, I still get goosebumps. Um, I still feel, I still feel as though, did I really consider the shoulder? So when we watch this video, it's going to show two athletes, two Olympic level athletes, um, in their manual wheelchairs, pushing up a hill. One has a smart drive and one does not. Okay. Uh, for those of you that aren't fully familiar with the smart drive, you know, ask questions. I've, I've included information on it, ask questions on it, but it's to help. It, it gives you assistance with pushing so you don't have to propel off a big hill as you're gonna see in this video. Now I used to teach and I'm definitely not suggesting that we never teach our clients or, or you know, manual wheelchair users how to push up a hill. Everyone should know how, it's an important skill. But just because you have to learn a skill doesn't mean that you should have to use that skill every single day. So let's watch this video. I'll just mute it. There we go. And let's watch this video and see what's happening. Look at the individual on the left and how hard it is for her to get up this hill versus the individual on the right. Now, some of you may be laughing watching that, right? When I show this, a lot of times people laugh. I'm gonna pause it and I'm gonna play it again. A lot of times people laugh the first time and that's okay. You know, it, it, the girl on the left, on the right is, is definitely smiling, looking at how much easier it is for her to get up this hill. But really consider the shoulder this time. Really consider what's happening to this woman on the left and her shoulders. How many times a day does she have to go up this ramp? This is a pretty short ramp. If she does this every day, 
if she does this three times a week, what are we doing to her shoulders over the lifetime of her shoulders? Are we considering power assist? This is a Olympic level athlete, but we still need to consider her shoulder health and function as well. And I wanna leave you guys with this quote from today. I know funding, I know we have lots of, lots of things out there that can, can limit us in what we're trying to do and trying to have best practice. But remember, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Remember what you learned today. Continue with your continuing education courses. Continue to research and learn. Ask questions. And then use that education to pass on to everyone else around you. Thank you guys for staying on for this webinar. I'm going to pass it back over to Jenith. I know we've got a limited time of, of questions, but hopefully we can ask um, answer some of your questions. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, that was a wonderful summary on anatomy, physiology, and biomechanics of the shoulder joint, um, how your equipment selection impacts that. And, you know, we, we understand that that's only part of the story. There's transfers, there's additional activities, but hopefully you got a better understanding of how equipment selection and posture um, can help support those um, healthy upper extremity goals. Uh, just for some housekeeping items and if we don't get to your question today we will respond individually in a follow-up email um, so if you have questions about any of the content you can reach out to rachel her email is on the screen um, rachel.fabiniak at permobile.com if you have any questions about webinar details you can reach out to us at education at permobile.com just about the um, more of the kind of housekeeping handouts that kind of thing uh, I want to mention our next month's webinar. We have a really exciting new product launch from TyLite, uh, the new TyLite MXA, who qualifies and how and how is performance optimized? Um, sorry, too many letters in that one. Um, but so we want to really talk about a new product that we have for you in our manual product line. So please um, tune in to this webinar next month. And um, thank you so much for attending today. I wanted to address just two questions um, if uh, people are able to stay on. Um, I think, you know, one question that is coming up quite a bit is about funding. And Rachel, I know you addressed that um, already in, in your presentation. But what I wanted to kind of follow up on is, you know, depending on your region or your, your um, country, there are additional alternative funding sources that you can seek out. Um, so don't just stop at one, um, no, you can't get that, especially in the US if you have Medicare. Um, there are ways that we can, that, you know, your equipment provider or your clinician or your manufacturer can support you in giving you resources um, for additional funding. So um, you can appeal, you can always look for secondary funding sources, um, especially if you believe that that, like, for example, a power seat elevator is going to, you know, stop you from reaching overhead a thousand times a day or 500 times a day and i loved the numbers that you gave rachel um, because it really puts that impact in there um so we know funding is a limitation to some of these but there are some smaller things that you could do like rachel mentioned with postural um postural control and postural assessment just making sure that your posture is as good as it can be um, before you engage in some of those reaching activities if you don't have access to the power seat functions um i think rachel and and maybe you can speak to this in your territory and then i can say it from in the us but a lot of people that are online now um, um, want to know you know where can they go to find someone that really understands the a person who uses a manual wheelchair and this anatomy as well as you do today because you know it is kind of hard to find those clinicians that specialize um, in seating and mobility and i know here in the U.S., um, we have Resna, which is Rehab Engineering Society of North America. You can go on and you can find an ATP. And so you could look for somebody um, in your area by zip in your zip code that's a PT ATP or an OT ATP. And that's a great place to start. Um, a lot of the centers in, you know, some of the major cities like Ohio and Ohio, at Ohio State University, they have a wonderful seating clinic, um, Shepherd Center, Craig Hospital. I know those are not always 
close to everybody on this call, but any of the model SCI centers here in the US. Um, and then Rachel, I don't know if you wanna to speak to a good way, you know, internationally to find someone that has your qualifications. Yeah, that's great. Um, look, you know, I think part of it is, is also the communication. So I tell people there's a team, there's a team between the physical therapist, occupational therapist, whoever your, your seating therapist is, um, yourself, your supplier, your manufacturer, and you need to communicate to the to the team what your goals are. Um, and if you're the end user and you are concerned about your shoulders and about looking at them, you know, have that discussion. Um, ask them, you know, do you feel that you have the the knowledge to be able to or or the experience to be able to fully evaluate my shoulders? Do you think that I need to um, potentially go and, and see someone that, you know, we could bring along with us. Um, there are services here in Australia that, um, you know, seating kind of like a seating clinic, but that can go around and help um, with newer therapists and actually help support them. And just remember that, you know, there are resources. So, you know, you can always reach out to, to even your Permobile clinical education team. Um, and see if they know anyone in the area or getting them to um, to have that discussion. But I think having the discussion um, is a is a big part of it too. And and you know most of us learned this in our in our universities, but depending on how long we've been out, sometimes um, some of the information leaves us as we as we go along. But you know anyone that is um, a, a licensed therapist. Um, will will still have learned, um, you know, to some extent this in this information. So it just might be that you need to bring it up in in the discussion. They may be thinking about it, um, but they haven't even even expressed that they're they're considering it to you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that. And we will definitely um, get to any of your additional questions um, at, after we hang up here. And I wanted to mention to you guys, you do have the opportunity to fill out a survey upon completion of this webinar to let us know other topics um, that would be of interest or of to you or of help to your practice setting. Um, so please fill that out so that we can um, co continue to come up with innovative and creative topics that can help uh, really move our complex rehab technology industry forward and we hope you'll tune in on how um, next month to learn about the Tylight MXA who qualifies and how is performance optimized and um, we're gonna go ahead and sign off just in respect for time but um, we will um, don't forget you will have an email with a recording sent to you and a link to a certificate um, of attendance should you need that in the future and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody again this month, uh, next month, excuse me. And thank you so much, Rachel, for calling in from Australia. Thank you so much, Janice, and thank you everyone for attending. And I look forward to more webinars in the future. Thanks, guys. Right. Bye, guys.